I'm going to be your next speaker. I won't ask for a round of applause. I'll get you excited in some other way. Wow. Thank you. My name is Travis Cross, and I work in our industry in telecom, and in particular, I work in making our industry more secure and more private. And that's what we're going to talk about today. My talk is called The Crypto Conflict, and we'll talk in a moment about what that means. But first, I have a question for everyone in the room, which is, is privacy irrelevant? I mean, do you start to kind of feel that way? I mean, let's think for a moment about how, uh, look at all the ways in which maybe privacy doesn't matter anymore. I mean, there's Facebook, a lot of people use that. What, what other ways, what other things can we look at out in society that might be telling us that privacy isn't important to people anymore? Amazon Echo, that's a good one. What else? Indifference to Snowden and the revelations, that's a good one. What else? What do people see out there where you look at people and go, wow, does anyone care about their privacy? What are people using? OnStar, that's a great one. Yeah, everywhere you drive. Or, I mean, what Uber is tracking or Tesla, how things are, everything gets streamed up to Tesla's cl cloud for people driving Tesla cars. Track, yeah, the tracking devices that we all carry around with us all the time. Free USB charging, yes. That's why people have those USB condoms, right? That's what they're called. That's, what, that's the name for them. That is a technical term. <laughs> all right, but we also know that, I mean, people do care about their privacy in some ways. I mean... We saw with, uh, with some of the applications that have become popular, Snapchat seems like it was a response to wanting messages not to stick around forever, or uh, Telegram or Bitcoin. What else do people see out there that is indicative of people caring about their privacy? What, what do you see? Telegram. Telegram is a great example of maybe not the most secure app, but, but at least people feel more secure when using it. What else? iOS, Apple does a great job with security, and you know I think it's a it's a great reason people use the platform. What else? What else is attracting people to security and showing that people care about it? Tor, people who use Tor, it's a great answer. And so there's this conflict because we see that some things indicate that people like their privacy. We saw the big uproar over Cambridge Analytica and the way that Facebook was being used. But at the same time, we see all these examples of how people maybe don't care so much. And so in the 90s, we had a big fight about this. It was called the Crypto Wars. And, and it was this pitched battle for the future of privacy in this electronic age. And maybe the start of the crypto wars was when AT&T released what was called the AT&T 3600. And it was this beautiful little box. And you put one on your side and the other guy put one on his side and you just plugged them into traditional telephones. And then when you made a call from one side to the other and it would do this modem negotiation and each side would see this little code and you would read this four digit code off to each other. And then your call was encrypted with with DES, the data encryption standard, and it was reasonably secure for the time, and it was authenticated. Each party could had agency and could see that they were, they were taking charge of the authentication. They knew they were talking with someone else using this box and that nobody else was listening in. And this freaked out the federal government so much that they went and bought up all of the AT&T 3600s from AT&T. They bought out their entire supply of the units that had the DES encryption, the secure ones. And what they did instead was that they issued this thing, this piece of technology called the Clipper chip that was backdoored encryption. It used a cipher the NSA published called Skipjack and all the keys were escrowed by the federal government. And the idea was to push this as the only approved legal way of civilians using cryptography. And so this kicked off a, a battle for, is this going to be the future? Is all technology going to be backdoored in this way? And around the same time, Phil Zimmerman released PGP 
into this mess. He, he testified at the Senate. He was investigated by the federal government for criminal prosecution. This was an exciting battle. And, you know, the thing that stands out to me in retrospect was how simple it was. It was, are we going to have privacy or not? Is this all going to be backdoored or are we going to be able to communicate securely? It was very black and white. It was like the Cold War. It felt moral and virtuous and, you know, fantastic. And, and, and you know, people got engaged around it because of that fundamental moral simplicity. But, and that war was won. It was a war you could win. It was, it was a war that had a finale that, that we, we walked away from it and the government repealed the export controls and we said, finally, now we can have privacy. And so if that was the crypto war, then what we have right now, I think maybe should be called the crypto conflict, Operation Enduring Privacy, or, you know, <laughs> It's a conflict that you feel like you can't win and is highly dimensional and is multifaceted and you don't know whether you're winning or not or, or what's good or bad anymore. And why is it this way? Why, why do we feel like this? Well, as we look back, we knew what privacy was. I mean, privacy was this natural state of affairs. It was something that if we go out behind the barn or out behind the building and talk, we have privacy because no one else can hear it. It's just a state of nature. But how do we define that? What do we say privacy is so that we can define it in this electronic age? Well, I'm going to say that privacy is having effective control over the disclosure of your information. Effective control. And that word effective is what's so critical in this modern era because we all have some natural degree of control, but making that effective in this technological era is the challenge. And if we define privacy in this way of saying that it's effective control over the disclosure of your information, that neatly resolves one of the core questions that has always plagued the debate about privacy, which is that if you have nothing to hide, then why is privacy important to you? That's always the refrain of the people who want to steal privacy. If you have nothing to hide, then why does privacy matter? And it's, you know, there's an element of it that's reasonable because privacy is so fleeting, it's so easy to lose, that there is a certain virtue in living in a way that, that if your privacy is lost, because it's so easy for it to be that that maybe it doesn't affect you so much. But by defining privacy as saying that it's that control, we can have it both ways. It's saying that, well, maybe it is virtuous to live in a way that we could live publicly and shamelessly, but that's not for somebody else to decide. That's for each person to decide about the control that they have over what they disclose and how they disclose it. And we should give them tools to be able to do that in this era. You know, looking back to the simpler time, we used to communicate to all of our friends and our families in private, but we don't do that anymore, not so much. You look at how people use Facebook and Instagram and all of these tools. I mean, from the time a person is born, if somebody's born in 2018, where are their baby pictures going to end up? It's going to be public out on Facebook. It's going to be shared on Instagram and maybe YouTube and all over the internet. And so despite the fact that we have, we retain a certain degree of control, it's much more difficult to make that control effective when the means of communicating have moved onto these third party platforms. And looking back, you know, the problem used to be intrusion. It used to be this concept that I have my privacy and I have the information that I want to keep. And there's some guy out there who's coming in and trying to take it. There's some agency or agent or spy or whatever who's coming to take my privacy. And 
the key thing about this era is it's not just intrusion. It's not somebody peeking into your bedroom or your life. The problem has become manipulation. Now, we've always said that information is power, but we're now starting to live it on an industrial scale, that information and our information, all of our information that's put out there is being used not because people want to know for some random purpose why we're doing this or that. They want to use it to control and manipulate us, to get us to buy things or to vote a certain way or who knows what in the future. But we're already seeing that infrastructure start to come together. And speaking of that manipulation, it really kind of creates a great contrast to a simpler time. If you think back to what was Google when they started in 2000 and 2002, when AdWords was something new, it felt okay. For advertising, it felt surprisingly okay. I think this is one reason why many of us still have a warm spot in our hearts for Google, is we remember a time where, yes, they were an advertising business, but it felt all right. Because I'm searching Google, I'm saying, I want a dog walking service. And Google shows me the results from all over the internet, and they also show me some people who so want to tell me about their dog walking service that they're willing to pay Google for it. But it felt all right because I asked. That was my relationship with Google. I said, I want dog walking services. They showed me some, including some paid results, and that felt okay. But does it feel okay now? Now that your information can be cross-linked and, and they can extract a few more pennies out of the search result if they know everywhere you've been because you're carrying your mobile phone, if they know all the rides you've taken with their new self-driving service, if they know all of your search results in the past and aggregate them together with everything they know about you from your email and your calendar and your, the network of your friends. They can look at all that information down a level and say that, well, because you're friends with these people and they do those things, that maybe this other result would be better. Or we should connect you with this or show you this instead. It starts feeling less pleasant. It starts feeling less pleasant to say nothing of Facebook and how they use their information or many of these other services. We're just picking on the big two. Back then, back in first crypto wars, the attack vector felt one to one. It felt like if somebody wanted to get at you, they had to do it themselves. They had to reach out. There had to be an attacker who was after you, and we were defending against that mostly. But now it's become one to many. Now this has become an industrialized operation where the people who are collecting and aggregating your information are doing it to all of us, and they're doing sophisticated attacks, manipulations, techniques to get at the data, collect it all up, package it, and sell it to other people who want to use, process, and manipulate that data. And previously, we were worried about people seeing things. We worried, what if somebody sees what I'm doing? What if somebody looks at it? Now we're worried about machines. The AI that we've been talking about is, in, inter, is integral in this. It's, it's par for the course for how this is happening is that we can now look at so much more data that it becomes necessary in some sense for organizations to try and collect huge volumes of it, put it together and have machines make sense of it so that we can feed it into this surveillance manipulation pipeline that we have. 20, 30 years ago, we were more clear about the concept of agency. Agency is who does somebody work for? If you hire a lawyer, they work for you. If you hire an accountant, they work for you. If you use a hammer, you might hit yourself on the hand with it, but the hammer is working for you. It's in your control. And that's how our tools felt before. If you had a IBM compatible PC in 1995, you weren't worried about that PC working for somebody else and serving their interests. But if you're carrying around a phone that has an operating system that pushes down automatic updates, from some you know, vendor, is that operating system serving your interest or is it serving theirs? 
If you're subscribing to some service, is it serving your interest or is it serving theirs? If you have a device in your home that's answering your questions, is it trying to serve your interests first or is it trying to serve the interests of somebody who's trying to sell you something or control you? It's a hard question to answer with our new era of technology. Back then, in the 90s and before, we were clear about who the public figures were. We were clear about who were celebrities and who were not celebrities. Celebrities were people you saw on television, saw in the news, saw in magazines. But now, today, we have lots of accidental celebrities. Now we have these people who fit all of the criteria we would have used 20 or 30 years ago to define a public figure. They publish enough information about themselves. They put themselves out there. But I don't think that many of those people view themselves as a public figure. And so our laws and our, tech, our cultural norms for treating public figures now in a way applies to a great many more people who maybe did not think that was part of the bargain that they were buying in for. And finally, looking back, it seems that companies felt they were a lot more secure than they do today. I mean, you look at the attacks that have happened out on companies, Sony, Target, Home Depot, Equifax, Ashley Madison, the Democratic National Committee, just reading the names, you, you can think of these attacks, and I guarantee at all levels of these companies now, up through the board and the CEOs and top executives, no one wants to be added to that list of companies where executives got fired and board members got replaced for having large breaches. And these companies are under attack in many ways. In some ways, it's attacks on their customers and their reputation, as in the examples I just gave. In other cases, it's attacks on their intellectual property. American Semiconductor, Micron have undergone recent high-profile attacks. It can be attacks on their core digital assets, Komodo, Diginotar. These were cert certificate authorities whose job is to keep things secret. And when they or their partners failed to do so, they lost a great deal of business value. And it can be attacks on the personal security of their staff in our business. We have customers from all over the world, for example, energy companies or NGOs who operate in parts of the world that are less nice than Chicago, Illinois, that are more dangerous. And if they're going into those places to hand out money, in, in the case of the NGOs, hand out resources, or to do big infrastructure contracts to build multi-million or multi-billion dollars worth of infrastructure, then the people who are making those decisions, who are doing those contracts, are subject in those countries to extortion, to kidnapping, against themselves and their family members. And these threats are facilitated by an intrusion into their privacy, but these are very physical threats. And we see that in other parts of the world, that there's this convergence between privacy and personal security. And companies now, when they're putting people out there in these areas of the world, have to take responsibility for this. Companies, too, are subject to this problem of agency, of who do the tools work for. Home Depot, for example, is compromised by one of their third-party vendors who had infrastructure in Home Depot's networks. So what is the solution? How do we get to a world of enduring privacy? How do we get out of this enduring conflict? There's lots of approaches to privacy and, and to security. And one element of that is, is pervasive security. This is already ongoing at the IETF and other groups. Is In the past, security was something you turn on. But now it, it has to be something that's always, always on, everywhere. Because the way that attacks work today is they go in through the weakest point and they work their way through. And so everything has to be secure. You have to secure, in particular, the operators of the networks. So the people in this room, everyone here, you are a target. The industrial scale attackers go after people like you because if they get to you, they get to all of your users. They get to everyone whose information you're responsible to, for protecting. 
but I think the deeper solution, the solution that is going to help us see this through into the far future is, is getting a handle on agency, is figuring out norms and, and policies and maybe laws for how do these devices and, and how does the software and these services that we use, how are they responsible for working for us? You, you know, I, I have a friend who, um, whenever he watched Star Trek, he said, you know, the most uh, amazing thing about Star Trek is not that they could use teleportation or use warp drives to get from one point to another point across the galaxy. The most impressive thing about Star Trek is that when two sh alien ships come up next to each other, they can transfer data. Their computers can talk to each other. That's what amazed him about Star Trek. You know what amazes me about Star Trek is that is that when people talk to the computer in Star Trek, they trusted it. Even though that computer was presumably written by their employer, the Federation staff, whenever they talked to it, whenever they gave a personal log to it and then decided to delete it, they never said to themselves, oh, well, it's not really going to be deleted. <laughs> They're going to keep a hold of that and it's in my personal record forever. They never said that, they always trusted it. It always did what the user asked. And so that's the future I wanna get to, is a future where these devices and the software we control actually works for the user. At Silent Circle, uh, we make tools for individuals and businesses to control their privacy and to, uh, to secure their personal security. Uh, one of our tools is, a, is an application, Silent Phone. It's a secure call and, and messaging application. And the way that we build this application is, is so that the device, the software, Silent Phone, takes responsibility for protecting the user. Because we, as human beings in this digital world, are going to need tools to protect us from what's happening out there, tools that operate on our behalf in this complex interconnected world. And so, for example, when you're making a secure call and you're using something like WebRTC, and WebRTC is great, by the way, because it took a secure by default mindset, but you're always still trusting a server because you've, you're relying on the TLS connection to the server and your ability to authenticate it. And you can't really take personal control of knowing, am I actually connected to the other guy or not? There, there has to be a service provider that's giving you that guarantee and you're, you're trusting them and you're trusting the certificate authorities and you're trusting everything in the chain. So as just one example, we build an app where we use ZRTP and something called the short authentication string so that if I'm making a call to Simon, he and I see words on our screen, just like that AT&T 3600 from 30 years ago that we can compare and we can take personal responsibility for ensuring that we have a secure call. And then everything else that that application does, all of its interactions with the network, everything it shows the user, is designed and built in such a way that the user, to protect the user from anything that's going on on the network. It doesn't trust us. It doesn't trust the network. It doesn't trust the internet. It doesn't trust anything that's happening outside. It always looks out for the user. And we think more software should be built that way because we believe that by restoring agency, we can restore privacy and build out a future that we're all happy to live in. Thank you very much.